let's have a word of prayer. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. Could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. These must be confessed prior to study because the Bible is a spiritual book. The Holy Spirit is the great teacher of it. He is able to reduce it into truth that sets you free from a system of beliefs that are in opposition to God or don't understand. It's a wonderful principle, but you can't get this in carnality. You get it in spirituality. The way to get from carnality to spirituality to the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit is confession of sin. First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I give you a moment of your priesthood to confess sin if necessary and go into your prayer life looking to the Holy Spirit now to teach you the truth of the word of God. He will teach and recall, John 14, 26. And so our Father, we're thankful tonight for these that have come our way by the automobile and the internet. I'm always thankful for face-to-face, -face, for that's the exercise of my gift and the ministry that flows from it to other people that are not able to, able to get in uh, to the 630 meeting. And we're thankful for their visit with us. I pray they would concentrate and not be distracted for this hour, that we might let the Holy Spirit have full reign in teaching and ministering the word of God to our souls in this hour in Jesus' name. Amen. As I mentioned in my introduction, James closes his book with a little special phrase. All the writers have their own way of doing it. Paul likes the word, for example, finally, brethren. <laughs> finally. Uh, he does this in Ephesians 10, 6, 10. Finally. Uh, he does it other places as well, but they all try to give you... Um, unless they're really onto something and they just write straight through to the end. Like, like maybe some of the smaller epistles, uh, like Jude or 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, something like that. In our lesson text, James is given a final lesson on the sin of the tongue. You remember, he, he's launched into it pretty strongly in the chapter 3. And now... Uh, he makes a final comment on it. And he's commenting to the Jewish custom, the custom that, the national custom of Israel, when he talks about the swearing oaths and stuff. This time, James is warning against invoking <laughs> the name of God or a member of the Godhead into everyday living in order, now watch this, in order to prove your loyalty or f truthfulness to other people. That's important. Good. You don't work with God because he knows your heart, so <laughs> I don't work with him. But it does work with other people, don't it? I swear to God, mother, I didn't do that. Right? I swear to God. That wouldn't have worked in my home, but it works in homes that have a big, a big to-do with God, doesn't it? Uh, I heard a man say the other day, uh, I swear on my mother's grave. Well, apparently that's bigger than I thought it was. Uh, I guess that's pretty big. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, well, I heard him say it the other day, and I don't know who he's trying to impress. It didn't get to me, but it must have got to somebody who knew his ma. I mean, I'd have to know the mother. <laughs> but apparently people do that. I mean, maybe they do that more common in the South. I don't know. But I, I'd heard him say that the other day like that. And he was trying to prove. I understood what he was trying to do. He's trying to. Convince him that I'm telling you the truth on something, but I don't know. I, I want to talk about four things today about James' warning about 
uh, his warning against actually invoking the name of God. Listen to me now, and this is important. In everyday discourses to prove one's loyalty or truthfulness. That's the point of it. When you have to do that, you're in trouble. You know that. You should never have to do that. Your character should be that. You shouldn't have to tell people. You have to believe me? Well, anyhow. And I just mentioned, I swear to God, I'm telling you the truth. James would say, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Don't invoke God. Somehow you and God are so close that you can believe you as well as you could believe God or something. I don't know. <laughs> I don't like that idea. But nobody could convince me how to listen to them because they invoke the name of God. Yeah. But that's just me, I guess. Point number one, I want to begin by dividing our lesson text into two parts for us to take a good serious look at and then correlate it with the Matthew 5, 33 through 37, if you don't mind. In the first part, James uses a negative, uh, and he gives three points on it. He says, don't swear an oath. That's a present active imperative of swearing an oath. He says, do not. Don't do this. He uses that with a negative may. A present active imperative, of course, is a command. He said, don't do this. Don't do it now. Don't do it ever. And if you've been doing it, stop it. <laughs> That's what that means. And then he tells you, don't do it under the three following conditions. Never, it's the word mete, never by heaven, never by the earth, and never by any other oath. So let's take a look over at Matthew, if you would, with me. We'll see what he means, what Jesus cl gave clarity about. Again, verse 33, again, you have heard that the ancients were told. You shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. Don't make empty vows. But I say to you, I tell you, I say to you, make no er oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God. See that? Or by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet. Or by Jerusalem, that for that, for it is the city of the great king. That's messianic, isn't it? You shall make you, nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. And anything beyond this as an oath, as a swearing oath of, with God, invoking his name, is evil. He pretty much explained it. Okay? And you can see how it related to the Jewish life, didn't it? And the culture and the system they were under. And so, to really understand, I mean, if you just picked up the book of James and read 5.12 and didn't have a study Bible that could refer you to Matthew 5, I bet your every one of your study Bibles in this room referred you to Matthew the fifth chapter, 33 through 37. Yes? Yes or no? Yeah, yeah they did. If you got a good study of the Bible, they're going to tell you that. Cross-reference footnote or somewhere. And uh, that says you've got a very good study Bible. Because that, that's the only way you could ever make sense of that. It's not left up there. I mean, right? So that's the first part. Then the second part of verse of uh, James 5.12, which I covered with Jesus' account, let your yes, that's a definite article with nigh, 
which is a particle of affirmation, let your, which is obvious, let your yes be yes. And your no, which is a definite article with Luke, let it be no. And here's the reason, he says, so that he and a plus the subjunctive with a negative of a negative purpose. So that you may not fall under judgment. The word under is the preposition hupo plus the accusative with reference to divine delegated authority. Divine delegated authority. You have him, listen to me now, you have him in all five divine institutions. Do not fall, aorist, active, subjunctive, second person, plural, that you may not fall under judgment. Like Jesus mentioned in Matthew 5.37 which we read. Divine delegated positions of authority should be sworn a person holding, this is how it got in the American system, divine delegated positions of authority should be sworn into office, in, like governmental. They are to be liable to both by the government and citizens and God. And we used to do this. We used to do this. In America, they used to put one hand on the Christian Holy Bible You know why it's a Christian Holy Bible? Because this New Testament completes the book. Those sworn in divine delegated positions in America can't bring their own Bible from some other religion or some other apostate culture, put their hand on it and swear to God who doesn't have anything to do with it. In America, based on our constitutional foundation, when you have an office of governmental, whether it is from the national, le federal level, all the way down to the local city government, When you're sworn into office, you put one hand on the word of God and pledge allegiance by oath to your office of whatever it is, to the citizens of whom you serve, and to God Almighty who established it. When Israel did not do that, it was, it was a nation under divine discipline as a priest nation. Listen to me now, this is important. When America doesn't do it, the America, it is a sign of apostasy, the rejection of God, and it's going to bring discipline to America. It's going to bring discipline. As a client nation that declares their foundation, their structural order structure and constitution is based on God of the Christian Bible. It's a big deal when you do that, and America has been a shining light because of it. And now we have reached into the darkness of the crevice of our soul in America, and we are in deep trouble in America, and apparently nobody cares, not even the church. We allow anybody to take an oath in any office in America and put their hand on some holy book that has not got any authorization with God in it and swear allegiance to America, which is stupid, because whatever God they're following, that's a God they're going to promote. It's idolatrous, 
it's paganism, and it will be the death of America, this kind of understanding. We're in deep trouble. We taught our children to go to school and pledge allegiance to the flag because we are under God. And that pledge allegiance to that flag has served America wonderful to this generation. And now we're in deep trouble. All you would have to do is watch the Democrats talk about what they will do for America. And you know we're in deep trouble. Because I don't consider this group even Democrats. They were not the people I grew up with. We are in deep trouble. We've thrown God under the bus in every aspect of divine institutional thinking in America. Man, I could not imagine as a student, my community, if, if I would have rebelled and said, I am not going to pledge my allegiance to my flag, listen, we'd have had a visit from all of the families that had lost people in war that died for that flag and the cause of America. Boy, if there was ever a time in our nation when we need to hit our knees daily and pray for our nation, and, and listen, we need to be bold in the church about bringing God back into the everyday affairs of our nation. God. I'm talking about God of the Christian Bible. There is no other God with a capital G. There are other gods. They're demonic You know what I sound like to most people today? A fool. A fool. I'll get, I'll get mail back on this. Bring it. Just bring it. Give me a chance to talk to you. I can tell you why I believe what I believe. If you can tell me what you believe. Point number two, the spiritually advancing believer should be developing his godly character in Christ so that he is trustworthy and is now to be, and is recognized to be now honest and truthful. Listen, before I came to Christ, don't hold me accountable for anything I was because I was a jerk. I'll be the first to tell you, if anybody drug up my past, I'd be the first to put it out on the laundry line. Of course I was a jerk. Of course I was full of me. Of course I was after my own ambitious desires. Of course I was a sinner. What do you expect from them? Jesus should expect more from me because I am in Christ. I have developed my character all from the word of God. You should be able to trust what I trust and believe what I believe. Now, if that doesn't suit you, that's okay. But I believe in the veracity of God. I believe he is absolutely truthful, and I, ex I, I believe he expects nothing less from me than that in my life. What I know to be absolutely true, I must be absolutely true about. I love people like that. I love people like that. I love to talk to people like that. I, I, like, to, I like to talk about our differences because we have something in common. If we can find something in common, we can talk about our differences. 
Job and Joseph are two great classic examples of this. Job and Joseph, they are wonderful examples of godly character in the Bible of every, in everyday life. They were the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow because of their relationship with God, because that's who he is. When your relationship gets in step with God, you'll be the same way God is. You'll, be, you'll have the character of God today, tomorrow, and forever. You're not going to be blown by every wind of, of controversy or, or doctrine. You're going to be stable. You're going to be the lighthouse in the storm. It's godly character that the world needs to see, not just a character. I love this about Job. When God brags on him, God says there is no one like him on earth. <laughs> now, somebody might have said about that, but they weren't, they weren't promoting it. No one like Job on earth. Could you imagine that? That God found a guy. There was no one like him on earth. God had one guy on the earth that was a light. And do you know, he lived during the time of Abraham. God never said that about Abraham, but he said it all the time about Job. Think about that. Who is this man? Job. I'll tell you what God said he was. He describes what God calls no man like him on earth, blameless all the time. Not just one day. You go back and say, well, I can remember back in the 40s I was blameless. That's the last time I remember. Every day, every day, here's what you got from, here's the guy you got. Every day, here's what you got for Job. Blameless, upright, fearing God, turning away from evil, and holds fast his integrity. Who wouldn't like to be around that guy? Who wouldn't call him up when they had a need and say, pray for me, Job. <laughs> pray for me, Job. I mean, who wouldn't want the one man on earth that God is so impressed to pray for you when God is so impressed with him? <laughs> I love that. And he still holds fast his integrity. That's after the first test when he lost everything, every detail in his life. still holds fast to his integrity. The book closes, the book of Job closes with Job still holding fast to his integrity. If you want to know what integrity is about, study Job. He's the only guy the Bible really highlights this in. And he tells you, blameless. Who can bring a charge against me? That's the book of Job. Who can bring a charge against me? Listen, that's the Bible. God says, who can bring a charge against me? That's the book of Job, upright, fearing God, turns away from Job. And we've been doing a study on Tuesday night of Joseph. What a what man of wonderful character he was. <clears throat> Everybody met him. They didn't spend any time in his six feet of space that weren't impressed with God. <laughs> he sold God so good because he wore him. He didn't just talk about him. He wore him. And the guy who talks about God and lives like the devil doesn't impress anybody once you get to know him. Here's the third point. Jesus. Now, here we're going to get down to crunch time. Jesus stood before a corrupt political judicial Jewish court that brought false witnesses to bring charges against Jesus so that a crime worthy of treason for a death penalty under Roman rule could be had. Think about that. A Jewish court goes this second trial. When they talk to the public, we're looking for the Messiah. And when they talk in private, let's kill him.
a corrupt political judicial Jewish court brought false witnesses with the idea of bringing a charge of treason against him. So Rome would put him to death. I want you to go with this to me in Matthew 26. I want you to take a look at this. We're, my Bible's in five, so I'm going over 26. You're familiar with this story. 59, if you have a study Bible, it actually starts in 57. Caiaphas, the high priest, and then... You know, he started with Annas, and now he's with Caiaphas. And Peter is introduced. He's been following the arrest party, and he's at a distance at the courtyard of court, the court, courtyard of the high priest. And entered and sat down with the officers to see the outcome. Verse 59, we're back to the high priest and the whole Jewish council. Sanhedrin kept trying to obtain false witnesses against Jesus in order that they might put him to death. They're going to try to bring a charge that Rome, because they couldn't kill anybody only without Rome consent. And uh, it would have to be something like treason. And they did not find any. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they couldn't find anybody that they could use the law, twist the law around them. They could find one. Do you know why? Listen to me. Because the law was the law of God. The Americans... Many false witnesses against the truth of the word of God as you want to bring, and it will not, it will not vary the truth of the word of God one iota. They brought false witness after false witnesses, schooled them on what to say, paid them off, they went, and they still couldn't get it. The law was that good. The people are that corrupt. And the law is that good. I'm telling you, our Constitution is so good. Never let them tweak it. It's founded on God Almighty, the veracity of God. And there's never been anything, never been anything like it. And its model was out of Judaism. And they brought witness after witness after witness, schooled them on how to do it. Listen, if you've paid attention to anything on the media, that's exactly what's been happening to everybody who's come before us with any judicial sense. They bring charges after charges on the most corrupt ways of, of humiliating people. I've never seen anything like it in my life. This is what they were doing. False witness after false witness. So they schooled them. They told them exactly what to say. And they still couldn't break the, the divine justice of God's law. <laughs> so they're going to have to go another way. And they will. They couldn't use their, their system. It was a divine system. But later on, two came forward. And they said, this man stated, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. The high priest stood, stood up and he said to him, Jesus, do you make no answer to this charge? What is it that these men are testifying against you? Right? Jesus kept silent. Now watch what the high priest does. I'm going to come back next week and do a study on this. Look what the high priest, he said, I adjure you. He just put, listen, this is the high priest. He's just put a Urim oath on this. I adjure you. See, you don't get this. I mean, 
the high priest, he wore this robe. I'll talk about it next week. But he pulled out the Urim, U-R-I-M oath, which means that everybody sitting in this court today has got to tell the absolute truth and will make a decision on the absolute truth. No, everyone, from the high priest to the person who's recording it, is under the oath of God's truth, the veracity of God. I adjure you by the living God. See, he's invoked God into this as the high priest. That you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. <clears throat> Jesus, who has been silent in these court cases because they are mock, mockery, answered, you have said it yourself. What do you think they just said? They just said, verse 61. I am able to destroy the temple of God. That was their view. And to rebuild it in three days. We know what that is, don't we? That's the resurrection. He's going to die on a cross. Three days later, he's going to be raised from the dead. They've misquoted John 2, 19, 20, 21 in there. You have said it yourself. You know what he's saying? I'll tell you, boys. You're going to hang me on a cross. And three days later, I'm going to be raised from the dead. And boys, that is this going to ring true? This, when this, this high priest says, beats his chest on the urine and says, everybody in court today will tell the truth from the high priest to the lawless person in the court. He brings in these false witnesses. And they say, he's, he said he would destroy the temple of God and three days raise it from the dead. <clears throat> and Jesus says, you said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on clouds of heaven. Oh, boy, am I ever the Messiah. Oh, boy. You see, he didn't say, boy, if you said one thing in court that's true to here today, I am Christ, I am the Messiah. He didn't say that. He said, you will witness it. This day will forever be recorded in the, in the records of heaven. You have no idea what day this is. This is the day the Lord has made. Rejoice and be glad in it, Jesus. Then the high priest tore his robe, and he said, he has blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you have now heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all answered, he is deserving of death. Then they spat in his face and beat him with their fist. Others slapped him, and they said, prophesy to us, you Christ, who is the one who hit you? And then we go back to Peter in verse 69. You see, what the priest demanded, Jesus gave him, gave him nothing else, but gave him to You want the truth? I'm going to give it to you, but I'm going to give it to you out of the Bible, which most of you guys don't even read. He didn't say that, but he insinuated it. You know nothing about the Messiah, but boy, are you going to learn a lot about him. I've been with you three and a half years. I've been with you 30-some years. You have not paid attention. You should have seen me in the Word of God all over the place, and you haven't. You will see me in a few, in a few days. You will see, see me, and you will see me again. You think, listen, you will know I am Christ in all eternity. For I will sit in the judgment seat of Christ and I will sit on the great white throne judgment. You will see me again in the court of God. That's what he just told him. We'll meet again in court, but it'll, it'll be me sitting on the judge, the seat of the judge. And he didn't have to say it. He told him it's in the Bible. 
If you guys studied the Bible, you would have been way ahead of this deal, but you're behind it. You better catch up. What a wonderful way to present the truth, huh? Without getting in people's face and calling them names. Hebrews 12, 2. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy sat before him, endured the cross, despised the shame, and sat down victorious at the right hand of the throne of God. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and sat down in the victory at the right hand of the throne of God. There's a coming another day of court. Listen. It's going to be worse than that fifth they went through. Hmm? This court here is going to go through a heavy-handed fifth by Rome. When they get through with Israel, and it ain't going to be nothing compared to what's going to happen at the great white throne judgment. Nothing. He's trying to give them a heads up. Nobody's listening. Probably like here. Point number four, Peter, standing outside this corrupt Jewish court, and in his third denial of Jesus Christ, listen to me, you will not see this in your English translation. You will see it in your Greek, pronounced an anathema curse and sworn an oath against Jesus Christ. Peter, standing outside this corrupt court, where he denies Christ three times, in his third denial, look at, we're in Matthew, just go down to 69, Peter sitting out in the courtyard with certain, uh, and a certain a servant girl comes and says, uh, you were with Jesus, the, the, the Galilean. He denied it. There's your first one before them and saying, I do not know what you were talking about. And when he had gone out to, to the gateway, in other words, get away from her, another servant girl saw him and said to, to those who were there, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. An oath. He swore an oath. Like a light one. God is my witness. God is my witness. I do not know this man. God is my witness. I do not know this man. I don't know no man, man. A little later, the bystanders came up and they said to Peter, surely you are one of them for the way you talk gives you away. The Galilean language. Watch out now. Then he began to curse and to swear an oath. Now, this is not cursing and swearing like we think, you know, you know, you swear worse than a sailor. I don't, I don't know because I was in the Army. So I don't know how bad they are. I know they're pretty bad in the Army, though. <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't know how that reputation got to them. But when he says... When he says curse, that's anathema with kata on the front of it. When you put, when you put kata, in other words, it intensifies it. It takes it out of the ballpark. That, that's not just a home run. That's out of the ballpark. That's an anathema curse. That's calling down the curses from God upon something. And I wrote it down in verse 74 to 75. Then he began to curse. I wrote it down. 
and to swear, which is the one we have in James 5, 12, that oath, swore an oath. May God send the anathema curse upon me if I'm not telling you the truth. And he swears an oath to the God of the heaven and the earth and all things in it that I do not know this man. I, my heart is sad when I read this. For what one of us could pale maybe, maybe in comparison to his loyalty to Christ up to this point? He left his business, his family, to serve the Lord. He proved himself to be one of the three loyal insiders to the ministry, thinking, planning, preparation of the ministry of Christ during his earthly ministry. He was one of three inner circle people. He believed in his heart that he was as loyal as a human being could be and as was as truthful and loyal to this man, Jesus Christ, as any one human being could be. And the truth of the matter, he was none of that. When he was in the garden with Jesus and they came to arrest him, he pulled his sword as if that is the way you solve your problems. The wrong sword, Peter. Come on, people. The sword he pulled was the wrong sword. He should have pulled the sword. But he pulled the one that cut off the high priest servant's ear. Who must have had a hard time in the court that day with Christ. What did he say? I don't know. Just thinking like a bystander. What sword should he have pulled? The word of God. What sword should you pull? When you think you have to just roll up your sleeve and get it done for God. Because that sword ain't going to fight. That sword is not the sword you use to fight the good fight of faith, people. That sword will get you in trouble every time, and it's a sign of your weakness, not your strength. When Jesus took his three inner circle guys to have prayer in Gethsemane before this occurred, Jesus said, I need you. If I ever needed you in an hour of my life for prayer, I need you now. Stay awake. And pray for me. What they do? They slept. You know where their energy would have come from? They were tired. Jesus was tired. They were all tired. Where did he get his strength? Where did he get his strength to do this? He got it through the power of the Holy Spirit. He got it through the divine system, didn't he? When he was so tired, he wanted to lay down and go to sleep. He had to finish business first. He had to do God's work. The disciples, nah, lay down to sleep. Let him do it. When he said to them, I need you more than I've ever need you in the past in prayer to stay awake, stay awake and pray with me. And they slept. And that's a soul problem. That's not a physical problem. That's a soul problem, my dear people. That's a soul problem. That's not a physical problem. That's a soul problem.
and you now see it. Now you see it in Peter. So he, in his third denial, he gets into the anathema curse and swears an oath. I do not know this man. And immediately, don't you love God's timing? Yeah, when you're a spectator, but not when your boots are on the ground and the rooster's crowing and you're in trouble. And immediately, the rooster crows. And Peter remembered the word. It took a crow. Thank God for a crow. It took a crow to stimulate his conscience for the Holy Spirit to recall a truth. Peter remembered the word which Jesus had said before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and bit, wept bitterly. Now I suppose... You think this is the end of the story and everybody clap because it's over. This is Hallmark. We're waiting for the kiss. So let me tell you, when you get caught, where you shouldn't be doing the raw things you shouldn't be doing and wow, 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 wow. And you weep bitterly. You need to ask yourself, now what? Because so far we haven't done anything right. Yeah, got me? And if you think weeping bitterly is going to purge your soul and get you back into a relationship with God, you could be farther from the truth. You know what you're going to have to do to get back into fellowship with God? You're going to have to confess your sin. I don't care how long. I don't care if you weep bitterly for 10 days. To prove my point, you're not going to find this guy again. You're not going to find Peter again for a while. Peter was absent at the crucifixion, so much for weeping bitterly. He was absent at the burial, so much for weeping bitterly. He was absent at the tomb, so much for weeping bitterly. However, he, along with other male disciples in hiding, did respond to the women disciples who were in all of it. God bless the women disciples. They were in all of it. They were at the crucifixion. They were at the burial. They were at the tomb. God bless them. They bring back news to the hiding disciples that Jesus has a message for them that he told them before he died. I'm going to meet you on, a, on our favorite mountain of prayer in Galilee. I love the way the Bible describes them showing up. No male disciple's name is mentioned. Only the 11 disciples showed up. The 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. Now here's what's interesting. God's marvelous plan in the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus Christ, had it not been for the post-resurrection appearance of Jesus Christ, we would have not found these 11 disciples ever again probably. But during the post-resurrection appearances, Jesus appeared to all these disciples and trained them, loved on them. Listen to me, and especially Peter. Don't you know Peter who used to sit at the, in the front row under, at the feet of Jesus and loved everything that came out of his mouth was now sitting in the very back of the lessons? Didn't want to have the eyes of Christ look down into his eyes and talk to his heart. I don't know, I'm just saying. But Jesus loved on all these male disciples, 
loved on him, taught him. Maybe you will listen to me now. And they did. And he brought them all back into the fold as a good shepherd. He found them the second time like he found them the first time. He found one by the lake, one by the hill, one over here, one over there. Jesus went out, if you pay any attention to the post resurrection appearance, and found the boys. Just like he did when he came down, he said, I want you to come follow me. Jesus goes back and he goes and he finds them. They're out, they're out fishing. They're out, they went back to their old life. And he goes out again and he calls them all but one. Matthew, come on, Matthew. Come on, Matthew. We got work to do, son. We've got work to do. And I'm leaving it with you. The vineyard is going to be yours. And he goes back and he picks them all up, loves on them, teaches them. Now they're listening. They got to listen. It don't matter how late in the night it is. Teach on, preacher. Teach on. I used, to ha I, used to ha I used to have people like that. I used to have people, I'd teach two hours, and they begged me to stay longer. And I went, look, I'm about to faint. I used to have people like that. Not that I don't have them now. I couldn't go two hours without fainting. I go two hours, but not without fainting. Peter was willing to do anything for Jesus, but listen, that should not be goals, but God's. Listen, he was willing to do anything for Jesus, but God's will. That was his struggle. He would do some of it, but not all of it. So you can't pick and choose what you're going to do with God's will. When he lays it on your heart, you got to do it. You can't pick and choose it. He picks and chooses and gives it to you. It's a gift. God's will is a gift. You're blessed to have it. You need to read Matthew 26, 33, 34, and Luke, 20, Luke 22, 31, 34, which Peter didn't hear. Jesus said to him, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked permission to sift you like wheat. And it's been granted. You didn't pay any attention to it. You didn't pay attention to it. Well, anyhow, next time when we come back, I'm going to take a look at this. I'm going to show you something about these oaths that went on in this corrupt court. And it, it's no, no, there's no way that this court is ever going to get when they, they the last stronghold to be able to bring reformation into Israel's life is the leadership of the court system. And when it goes down, you're done. When it's corrupt from the top down, what you got? So our Father, we're thankful tonight for these that have come our way to study with us. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the word of God to our souls. Not to be critical of Peter. Father, we're all there. There are times in our life we think we're secure. We, we think we could do what we got to do. But if it's in the energy of the flesh, it will fail when it's designed to, to be done by faith in the plan of God, we walk by faith, not by sight. We're thankful, Father, you're a forgiving Father, and you care about us. You had your eyes on Peter before Peter knew he had eyes. And eternity passed. You still care for more than he cares for himself or anybody else. as your desire to see him fulfill his destiny and the plan of God. And so he did. May we be those people in the loving forgiveness of God, still willing to get back up on our feet, put our hands to the plow and now look back. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.